uh, of a book uh, titled uh, Principle of Economics by Karl Menger in 1871. Okay, but again, my task today is not to give an historical excursus on the evolution of the Austrian school. If some of you is interested in that, can drop me an email and I will send you a book on this. Okay. The, my aim today would be for the ones among you that are interested in uh, becoming economists to understand what does it mean to be an Austrian economist. What uh, Austrian economists think an economist should do as a profession. What's the task of uh, an economist? So this means try to define what we as Austrian economists uh, understand to be economics as a science. And recently, this was really by chance, reading a paper by Virgin Starr, which is an economist at George Mason University, I found this very interesting uh, uh, definition, a science of meaning. Okay? So, I, I like this definition and I will use it as a, a, the core of my presentation, uh, trying to explain why Austrian economics can be defined as a science of meaning. The passage in which Virgin Starr uh, comes out with this definition is this one. To be an Austrian economist is to be concerned with meaning. If we hope to understand human action, then we must pay attention to the meanings that individuals attach to their actions and to the actions of others and to the various choices that they are considering and to the possible outcomes of those choices. Ours is a truth, a science of meaning. This is a very recent paper published last December. So, uh, this means that in order to understand what is economics and uh, what does it mean to be an economist for Austrian economists, we should totally redefine our approach to economics. How many of you are studying economics? <laughs> so, can some of you give us, for example, you, Oran Baru, give us a <laughs> definition of what is written in your, don't, don't, don't look here, what is written in your textbook about economics? I think it's what? about, about the Australian, it's about... No, not Australian, Austrian. <laughs> Austrian. <laughs> no, but, but I don't want to hear the Austrian definition. When you, when you went to school, to, to college, and uh, you open your micro book, and it's written. Oh, economics is about? It's about um, using uh, the limited of uh, resource to fulfill the unlimited needed. Yeah, the allocation of scarce resources in order to fulfill unlimited needs or more or less. I mean, this is what you usually read on your textbook, which is partially true. But such a definition doesn't give us the full story. Austrian economists go a step behind. According to Ludwig von Mises, that was probably the most prominent uh, member of the Austrian school together with, uh, with Hayek, and uh, which was born in 1881 and passed away in uh, 1973, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the task of economics is to investigate the market phenomena. That is, the determination of the mutual exchange ratios of the goods and service negotiated on the market, their origin in human action, and their effects upon later action. This is the key point. In a way, economics has to do with human action. And we will see immediately what is uh, human action, according to Mises. We know, and I think we all agree, on the fact that action is always motivated by the urge to remove a felt uneasiness. You came here today because you are thinking 
that you are getting a benefit out of it. So you perceive an ignorance in your knowledge and you hope to fill the gap. Pay attention. The fact that uh, in coming here you hope to acquire previously unknown knowledge doesn't mean you will. Okay. Yeah. So when we choose a course of action, and this is one of the key tenets of Austrian economics, when we choose a course of action, we do, uh, we do it by assuming that we will achieve our goal. But in that assumption is not written the certain outcome. When you approach a girl, you hope that she will say yes to you, right? <laughs> Nobody would do hoping for a no, right? We all hope for a yes. <laughs> but in between your proposal and that yes, there is a, her freedom, right? Faham? Faham. <laughs> so, to make it, to make complicated something that is indeed very simple, as I just showed you, Mises says that human action is purposeful behavior. Okay? We all behave with a purpose. Action, and pay attention to the words that here I put uh, in bold and uh, italic, action is will put into operation and transform into an agency, is aiming at ends and goals, is the ego's meaningful response to stimuli and to the condition of its environment, is a person's conscious adjustment to the state of the universe that determines his life. So, Eichel this morning came to this seminar mostly, hopefully, to learn something about Austrian economics and uh, policy. But he received also different stimulus, stimulus from his environment. He might have noted some pretty girl. Okay. And this change his expectations and goals and ends. In order to do so, he has to engage his will. Okay put into operation and transform into agency. That means, uh, let's go to it together, let's go to cinema together. He cannot keep this uh, in his mind, because otherwise, if this will doesn't become agency, uh, uh, nothing will happen in reality. Okay, we remain a pious dream. But this will put, to, put into agency is a meaningful response. He is going to do so because he thinks he attaches meaning to the fact that having an eventual relationship will make him more happy. It is clear. This is economics. This is not uh, love affairs, but <laughs> love affairs are economics. Because economics is human action. And what is more human action than love affairs? <laughs> <laughs> so there is nothing more economics than love affairs. So, <clears throat> if we conceive economics in such a way, which are the main consequences? First of all, the definition that your colleague gave us before is not enough. Economic analysis cannot be reduced to the allocative problem, the so-called economization which is what your colleague told us, the allocating scarce resources to a certain number of uh, uh, defined ends. Okay. There is something before economizing. Before economizing, we must choose our purpose. Okay. So before choosing how to allocate our scarce resources, like it was said this morning by Chris, time, we, we, we have to choose our end. Before choosing to allocate your time to come here this morning, you must have decided inside yourself that the expectations that you get from coming here is higher from the expectation of doing something else. Going to cinema, going to college, going to work or whatever. I'm skipping going to office today. <laughs> 
But it's important to say that our purpose arises always from our interaction with reality. Is in the impact between the subject, ourself, and the object, reality, that we define our purposes. <coughs> so, to use again complicated words, I like to say that the interaction between people and between people and the surrounding world initiate hermeneutical processes which means interpretational moments necessary to identify the ends we think are for, are for, striving for. So when we impact with reality, when we impact with our people, we start to understand, to interpret what's going on, what's going around us, okay? And so you start to choose what's important for you. You cannot define your uh, final ends if you are not in relationship with reality and if you are not interpreting reality. Okay. So our action, as we will see in a while, is always a subjective reaction to objective elements. But I will come back to this soon. So after we engage ourselves, with hermeneutical processes, we identify means that we think are suitable in order to reach our ends. So if Eichel want to go invite outside one of the girls in order to conquer her, he has to start to think which are the means that are suitable for my end. Better cinema, better restaurant, and if restaurant, better Italian restaurant, better Makanan Padang, uh, Apalagi. And of course, he will have to count his money first. <laughs> but the important thing is that before allocating his scarce resources to achieve his end, he had to define his end. And he could define his end because he impacted with the reality and interpreted reality and was thinking that a certain person might make him happy. Okay? Clear? So, conscious choices emerge from interaction between acting people. And these people are active minds interpreting the situations around them. So, human action, by definition, has a dynamic nature. Action, the word itself is telling you that is something that has to do with movement. Action, right? Cannot be static, like the economics that we study in our textbooks. They're pretty static, nothing happened. There are two cubes that are crossing each other, magical point, equilibrium, and then nothing happened. If you engage yourself with reality, you realize that reality is much different from what you study in the textbooks. And therefore, after we define our ends, we have to identify plans, okay, and implement them. And this implementation of plans happen in time. The other missing item of mainstream economics, time. The economics that you study every day in college are timeless, like if things happen instantaneously, okay? which is a very big problem because uh, it's only in time that things happen. When Heikel decided to invite a girl outside for dinner, he has to shower, he has to do some perfume, then he has to go meet her, and let's say they uh, go out for dinner, they might discover that they like each other, or they might discover that they don't like each other, or there is only a one sense liking. Okay. Uh, but this discovery process happened only in time. So, in the morning in which Eichel decided to invite a girl outside for dinner, you cannot know what's going to happen at the end of that dinner. It's going to, to end in a church, 
or, or in the mosque, I don't know, where, where you get married, or it going to, to end in the lonely room of Eichel. <laughs> okay. But the problem with mainstream economics is that, uh, I mean, I, I put it in a funny way, but to tell you that uh, mainstream economics basically derive consequences from the assumptions. So the assumption is, Eichel is a man, fall in love with a woman, and uh, if Eichel follows state A, B, and C, they will get married. But reality is not like that. And we can know the outcome of uh, the action plan of Eichel only ex post, only after the plan was implemented. And the, the, the reality is completely open-ended under this perspective. And we come to uh, uh, the second point. Human action, in this sense, is always rational. This is another problem with uh, mainstream economics. All the discussion about rationality. Do you think you are rational? Yes. Not a little bit weird? <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> you, you consider yourself rational? What about you? You think yes. But the, the issue, the main issue is that when we talk about rationality in economics, people have the idea uh, of the so-called perfect knowledge. So only the homo economicus, which doesn't exist, is perfectly rational. And uh, rationality, according to economics, means that people never make mistakes. And if there are mistakes, means that people are irrational. This is a very limiting way to look at rationality. Because think more seriously. When Eichel is inviting the girl out for dinner, or the guy, it, eh? or the guy. <laughs> <laughs> Standard way. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't, or, or might be a guy, I mean, we, do, we don't know the set of preferences <laughs> to the uh, brain of Eichel. And, and that's why government control doesn't work. <laughs> uh, we don't know the outcome, but also Eichel doesn't know the, the outcome. It means that while inviting a girl outside without knowing the outcome, Eichel is irrational, or if the girls at the end of the night reject a second meeting with Eichel, or even before reject to meet Eichel, that Eichel is irrational, he did the wrong choice? Absolutely no. We adopt here a much wider approach to rationality, which means that ex ante, in advance, all actions are rational, which means that when we set, we, we decide our plan, in order to achieve our end, and we choose the means to use to achieve that, that end, we are always rational. Because the plan we choose is what we think is suitable for that. Of course, our knowledge is limited, and there will be always new knowledge entering, new information entering the picture because of the flow of time because every action happens in, plan, in time, okay? And therefore, our knowledge, our, the change of our knowledge might move us toward changing plans. And if uh, I can find out that the girl doesn't like him or doesn't want to meet him a second time, he will have to revise his plan. But this doesn't mean that his plan was wrong, was uh, adequate according to the information that he possessed at the moment at which he decided that plan. Clear? Then, in time, he can discover that that plan was inadequate, or even in time, can discover that he doesn't like girls. So he changed completely and want to become a priest. Okay? <laughs> and uh, and vocate himself to chastity. It's a matter of subjective preferences, but subjective preferences arise only in time via information that is 
always changing. Clear? So, this is another very important point that I want you to bring home. Time is a constant vehicle of novelty and the main means through which information is carried. You don't get more information without passage of time. Today you are gaining a lot of information, but in order to, to, to this to happen, you must waste, in a way, your day to be here. Some of you came from very far away, so knows how time is important for the flow of information. Here. Now, I will not go too much into the distinction that Austrian economists do between Newtonian versus real time, because it would be probably ask you too much. If some of you is interested, I can send you the references for deepening this. But just to, to explain you this briefly, the time uh, that is usually uh, used for economic analysis is uh, uh, what is called a spatialized time, geometric time. Things in T1, T2, nothing happened between T1 and T2. Instead, the time that we want to use is a dynamic time. And between moment A and moment B, everything can happen. Okay? And uh, therefore, the outcome of our action is uh, not determined. And now we come to the main point uh, that gives the title to my presentation. Human action, as defined by Mises, is also the ego. You know what, uh, what I mean by ego? Yeah, the, the self, your personality. The ego's meaningful response to stimuli and to the conditions of its environment. So when we talk about meaning, so a response with meaning, we are giving to the economists a new task the task to interpret human actions and to try to understand their meaning. Actions are meaningfully connected with the final end act the actors try to achieve. And this is what is called radical subjectivism. So, what all does mean? All this does mean? We cannot, as economists, limit ourselves to observing the reality. Okay? Observing is not enough. In a textbook there is this example. Imagine someone from space uh, looking at uh, a normal city uh, in the morning uh, along the day for a month. This uh, person, that this uh, alien that doesn't know anything about human life <coughs> will notice that uh, more or less, everybody between 7 and 8 o'clock in the morning goes out from big boxes called houses and go inside small boxes called cars. And these small boxes move the people from one place to another place. And after 10 hours, it happened the opposite thing. These people go from that box inside the small box again and go into the other big box again. Right? <laughs> but for an alien, all this thing would be meaningless. Why people are leaving big boxes, going into small boxes that move around, go always to the same place, and after 10 hours they do the opposite path? What's going on? So the alien will try to interpret, to give a meaning to this. We are part of the society, so we already know that this is the commuting from home to office and from office to home. But as an economist, uh, as economists, our task is not different from the one of these aliens, trying to understand certain patterns of reality. Okay, not only look at reality, but first try to understand the meaning that people attach to their reality, and second, give ourselves a meaning to what's going on. 
So, uh, in example, people give a meaning to the green color and the traffic light, and they will move. Okay, and uh, this is their interpretation. Green light, I move, I go smoothly to office. Mm -hmm. But as economists, we look at things from a bigger perspective and we can observe the general flow of traffic and see it working even if there are no traffic lights. No? So, <clears throat> i give you another example that helps more. Uh, you know that I live in Malaysia. In Malaysia, there is a strange habit for us uh, Europeans, uh, which is that in the road with three lanes, people drive in the middle. In Europe, we are used to drive uh, on the extreme side for the slow lane, in the middle for overcome, and on the other extreme side to go very fast, to patch up. Okay? In Malaysia, but, but of course, in Malaysia, the written rule is exactly the same. You stay on the left to go slow, in the middle to overcome, and then as, as soon as possible you go back on the left, and then you have the fast lane to overcome. In Malaysia, there is an unwritten rule according to which people feel more safe in driving in the middle, which is a very big mess for a European to understand how to drive. In the end, I always drive in the slow lane because there is nobody there, and I go to patch patch in the slow lane, so I adapted myself to the local style. Uh, but the meaning that people attach to the fact that they drive in the middle is that they feel safe creating a spontaneous, uh, a spontaneous order in a way which is against the written rule so there is an unwritten rule that is much powerful much more powerful than the unwritten rule okay? but as economists instead our task is not simply to wonder why they drive in the middle and then we discover by inquiring that they drive in the middle because they feel safe. But our task is also to realize and to become aware that indeed this habit creates a spontaneous order. It is wrong according to the rules, but it works. <laughs> because people among them accept this. So for them, it's not strange the fact that they are driving in the middle. It's completely normal. They look at me as an insane, because hmm. I'm the only one following the rule. Hmm. But they are following a sort of an unwritten rule which works because it's accepted. And as Tom, Tom told this morning, is the result of human action, but not of human design. Okay, spontaneous outcome. But our task as an economist is to recognize this spontaneous outcome. The economic actor doesn't care about the general consequences. Like uh, the people uh, uh, producing table eggs in a layer of chicken farms, they don't care about your breakfast. They want to make money, right? So they just want to make money, and because they want to make money, you are eating scrambled eggs in the morning. And this is the meaning that the people attach to their actions. You want to get breakfast, they want to make money. As an economist, I realize that profit orientation made people fed. This is the interpretation activity done by economists. Done by economists, why? When, as Mises, they realized that therefore, economics is not about things and tangible material objects, but it is about men. Economics is about men, their meanings and their actions. There are no actions without meanings. Goods, commodities, and wealth, and all the other notions of conduct are not elements of nature. They are elements of human meaning and conduct. He who wants to deal with them must not look at the external world. You must search for them in the meaning of acting men. So, look at this. Good commodities and wealth are not elements of nature. 
they are elements of human meaning and conduct. He wants to deal with them, must not look at the external world. He must search for them in the meaning of acting man. Is this quite alternative with what you learn in college? For economic students? Is it a bit different? Yeah, different. Yeah? Quite different. So, from tomorrow, revolution. <laughs> <laughs> it changed all the textbooks. If you need the recommendation for alternative textbooks, I will be happy to, to, to give advice. So, in this way, we enter a world of interpretations. And uh, this is uh, my personal conviction, is that in interpretation processes are the necessary subjective link between different objective facts and events. So human actions are objective facts. If I punch Iqbal, <laughs> that is not really subjective. It's very objective. <laughs> okay, he will feel it. But the answer, the answer to object uh, facts are our human actions. But the way in which answers are defined is totally subjective. The outcome of interpretation processes, which I define as, as hermeneutical actions. So if I punch Iqbal, Iqbal can react punching me as a response, right? In a stronger way. Or maybe because uh, we know each other and we respect each other, <laughs> He would say, hey, why is punching me? Maybe he has a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> so we we'll wonder why, and we'll invite me for a peaceful discussion. <laughs> this is a subjective response. Okay. Just to make another example that is in, uh, um, in, in my latest book, and is more, probably will help you more to understand how even economic development is related with subjective processes, is this, imagine an earthquake, and in Indonesia, you are quite experienced with that, yeah. right? um, or a volcano explosion, a natural disaster. Destruction everywhere, okay? What will happen after that disaster? This very much depends on the psychological reaction of the community. Because let, let's talk about a very extreme religious community, fanatic, they will say, okay, this disaster is the sign that the end of the world is close, God is punishing because we are like Sodom and Gomorrah, <laughs> <laughs> and therefore now we just have to kneel down and wait for the sword of God and the final judgment. This is a perfectly legitimate answer. I'm not giving any uh, preference on this is, a, is an answer that can happen. The economical result of this will be that that uh, environment will not be rebuilt. People are just waiting to die. <laughs> so there is no point to build new schools, new infrastructures, new companies, entrepreneurial spirit. No point. Because the preferences and the interpretations are oriented in a certain way. But the community can react in another way and say, listen, all these, peop all these uh, buildings collapsed because in the past we built shitty buildings. They are not uh, according and uh, strong enough to keep the pace with uh, uh, natural disasters. We don't want this to happen again to our children. So let's build something better for the future of our community. I'm not saying that one response is better than the other. I'm just saying that in front of the very same objective facts, the interpretation processes going into the subjective mind can bring out a completely different economic outcome. So you realize that economic development, economic uh, situations are not uh, simply objective facts, but are the results of subjective interpretational processes. So I say that without interpretation, reality could not take shape because no action would be decided. If you don't put your mind uh, in action in front of the reality, 
you just stand still. You know? You don't react. And if there is no subjective reaction, there is no action. Is it clear how the shape taken by reality depends on subjective interpretational processes? Fun, yeah? So, <coughs> as uh, also, again Virgil Storr wrote, for Austrian economists to deal with meaning means that their main task is attempting to understand purposeful action and thus the emergence of social phenomena, the opinions and beliefs that guide individual decision making, which is very much in the tradition of Austrian econ economics. Some people say that uh, the people inside the Austrian school that put so much attention on hermeneutics and interpretation are not really Austrian economists. But if we look at what Hayek said, was very radical. Hayek is the only member of the Austrian School of Economics that won a Nobel Prize in 1974. The things are what the acting people <coughs> think they are. And the facts of the social sciences are merely opinions, views held by the people whose actions we study. Things are what the acting people think they are. So if you are in front of a stack and you have a fork and knife, but you don't perceive fork and knife as something useful in order to cut the stack, you are not going to cut the stack. Even if objectively fork and stack are conceived to cut a stack, if there is not your subjective recognition of that fact, the stack will not be cut. This is not to, to make a sophism, so that maybe my Thomistic friends would be disappointed by, by <laughs> this, but uh, think about it. I, I'm not denying the nature of uh, a fork and, and knife, their suitability to cut a stack. Of course, we are all sound people and we recognize it. But in order to cut the stack, you have to have that recognition process. If you don't recognize it, you don't know. You come from another planet. You even don't know that the stack is full, <laughs> right? So your personal recognition of a certain object in order to fulfill your end must be re is, is necessary in order to achieve that end. Is a, there is this subjective link between objective facts that cannot be eliminated. Is it clear? In this sense, everything is subjective. Even costs, benefit are private valuation, and costs are personal individual perception of foregone opportunities. What's the cost of yourself going to college? How much is the fee of your college? In a class? Yeah, how much you pay for one year of college? I'll pay for college? Yeah. I get the scholarship. So you don't pay anything. <laughs> <laughs> of course you go to college. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's say that the, the fee is 100 million rupiah. Okay. Do you think that the cost of going to college is 100 million rupiahs? Wrong. Your cost of going one year to college is what you perceived you are missing by going to college. Yeah. Okay, so your real cost is not the monetary expense, the 100 million rupiah. But let's say, oh my God, I'm not going to college, but maybe I should have gone to work yeah, for one year. Brapa, yeah? Satu, satu tagum kerja, yeah? Brapa, yeah? That's all? Depends. And you think, maybe I should have uh, worked for one year and get that rupiahs. So it means that the benefit that subjectively Okay, you think, you think you will get by graduating is higher than the cost you think, the, by the, the revenue that you think you are missing now. So if you 
think that in one year, in three years of college, you might have earned, I don't know, 200 million rupees. Uh, in, in, you imagine that by graduating and going to work, you are going to make more money. In many cases, you are wrong in Europe now. Uh, so it's better to go to work rather than going to college. But in here, it's still different. So, which are the consequences of an economics? I still can go ahead. I mean, I think it's fine. Um, although the ultimate decision making power, I think, lies with uh, Taka okay. and Alfie as the main yeah. organizers. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah. I, I would say roughly, I mean, maybe another 15 minutes or so, yeah. and then we can start discussing. Yeah, discussing. Okay. okay. Well, I, I will try to finish this first part. Then I, I have another part of the presentation that is less philosophical, that is what, which are the main points of Austrian economics mm -hmm. in theory. But I can skip that, and we can eventually use it uh, during the, uh, the discussion. So, the consequences of looking at economics <coughs> as a science of meaning. First of all, and this is very important and so much neglected by uh, the traditional way to teach economics, being conscious that there must be a link between economics and reality. That formal rigor cannot be preferred to a higher degree of understanding reality. What's the point to have, to have a very fantastic, perfect, elegant, mathematical model mm -hmm. if it doesn't tell me anything about reality? If it's there, wow, it's beautiful. Yeah. So but it's, it's, it's a masturbation, I mean, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's not real, it's not linked with reality. So. Economics, if it has to deal with human action and with the meaning of human action, has to be linked with reality. And often, qualitative explanations are much more important than quantitative explanations. Second point, economics cannot be deterministic. What it means deterministic? Deterministic is when, from determinism is when you assume the consequences from the assumption. So I punch Iqbal, Iqbal punch me back. Mathematical reaction. I, I do one, the outcome is already written. But if we, if we conceive economics as we did so far, we understand that economics cannot be deterministic. Our world is an open ended world. Choices depend on evaluation in a specific knowledge and space time context. The girl that maybe Eichel today likes, in 10 years will not like. Because here this content of knowledge changes and the four these preferences will change. <laughs> As we say, maybe we'll even not like any more girls. <laughs> and become a priest. <laughs> become a priest. Become a priest. Yeah. So well, I was saying something about priests, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Catholic, I can't. <laughs> 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 So, uh, the future is shaped by how people react. So, the future is shaped by our interpretation. Okay, our actions follow our interpretation of reality. And therefore, more in our way to do economics, we deal human action while traditional economics, mainstream economics, deal with human reaction which is robot, who are the ones that react in a very deterministic way to situation of reality. Robots. You tell them, if A, then B, otherwise C. That is Pascal language, right? <coughs> Another important point that uh, is very much emphasized in a very beautiful book by uh, Stephen Horowitz, the importance of micro foundations when looking at macro phenomena. In a modern age, modern age economics, everybody is in love with statistics. Mm -hmm. no? uh, basically, the, in uh, newspapers and uh, in economic literature, uh, in particular in journal journalistic literature, uh, we live uh, in the religion of GDP, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, GDP went down. 
oh my god, GDP is not running fast enough. We have to have GDP running fast. What we do? GDP is a number which is calculated in a very specific way. C, consumption plus investment plus public expenditures plus the, plus the saldo between export and import, right? Mm -hmm. Then, we want to increase the GDP. China did it very fast. Spent, spent, spent. Mm. You go to northern China, the border with Mongolia, you have beautiful 10 lanes highways. Empty. Empty. <laughs> Nobody there. But when China spent this money to do so, the GDP statistics were going up. And all from Europe were saying, oh, amazing China. China model is working. See, they look at 8, they grow at 8, 9%. But who is caring about who is going to pay for that road? Micro foundations. So GDP grew a lot and fast by a government spending. Government spending supported by debt. He is going to pay for that debt. That's right. My generation in Italy is the one escaped for the from the country in order to avoid to pay for the debt done by our parents and grandparents. <laughs> yeah. That's why we are expatriates. So, look at the numbers. Okay, it is good. But look at what behind the number, inside the numbers, how these numbers are generated. The number itself doesn't tell you anything. Mm. Okay. Look at how GDP is created. How much is the amount of debt? How much is the... And even if you look only at investment, look, this investment from which industries come from? And why? Are coming from these industries because these industries are subsidized? So this industry becomes from out of government support? Look at the kaleidoscopic reality behind uh, the, 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 the marmor of the numbers. Numbers don't tell anything themselves. Finally, there are two kinds, as I, I see, I, I already told you, of understanding processes. The market players interpreting the surrounding reality. We want our breakfast. The producer of eggs want money. And the economists interpreting the reality shaped by market players, looking at the deeper meaning. In example, realizing that there is a spontaneous order created by market economy, or that traffic, la traffic in Malaysia works with different rules, and it works. So I think I will stop. I will leave this presentation with Taka. So Taka has this presentation. So if you want to, to have it, you just ask to him, or you can drop me him, no problem. Um, and the second part, I developed more which are the different theoretical contributions of the Austrian school in terms of knowledge, prices, what is the market according to the Austrian school, uh, why according to the Austrian school socialism is always impossible, any kind of central planning is impossible, but this can be part of the discussion if you want. Uh, business cycles, on which I wrote uh, three books, so <laughs> quite extensively. Uh, and at the end, as usual, as Daniel knows, I always give the bibliography, the references, uh, but this time is limited compared to the other time. Uh, these are some uh, books about the, Aust the history of the Austrian School of Economics and the main theoretical points. These are textbooks with an Austrian band. So if you want to learn traditional economics from an Austrian perspective, buy these books, or ask to me and I will send you uh, a scan copy. <laughs> uh, and these are the, 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 the main uh, papers that I use for this presentation. And here are some online resources as well, if you want uh, to browse a little bit, in particular on for the old uh, books from the mm. Austrian School of Economics on the Ludwig von Mises Institute website, you can download really savagely, like <laughs> five. <laughs> it's a really uh, mine. Okay? Thank you very much. Bravo, bravo.
Well, thank you very much, uh, Camilo. Um, actually, given that we, we have this unfortunate speaker cancellation for tomorrow, we couldn't...